ladies and gentlemen, Justin Perkins and Goose from Believe It or Not. How y'all boys doing? I'm doing great. I got to be first on that, and I didn't deserve to be, so <laughs> I'm excited <laughs> about that already. I am doing good as well, and yes, you do deserve that because it was your idea to do Believe It or Not. It was yes. my idea. Goose has done all the work. Man, I was going to ask, like, how, how did the show come about and stuff? And Killer Name, by the way, like, such a great name for a podcast. But what made y'all want to do all this? Um, for me, um, there was this podcast I really like. Uh, and <laughs> I wanted an excuse to work with them. And uh, I finally got to get on the show, and I met Goose, and I was like, Goose is awesome. I was like, I got to weasel my way in here somehow. And then, boom. He comes up with a great name for a show, and here we are. Well, thank you very much, Justin. Um, he uh, and it, it was totally his idea, you know. And uh, before we were going back and forth with the name, I said, "Whatever we name it, we need to put not in there." It's spelled K N O T T because we're both from Knott County, and uh, you know, some of our stories will be from Knott County, you know, stuff that's happened in Knott County, uh, Kentucky. Uh, we do have some stories that we talk about that's, you know, international or other locations, but we do try to keep it aimed towards Kentucky. That's cool, man. So I, I'm, I'm not very familiar with Knott County. I've been there a few times in my life, but like what type of uh, spooky, unusual happenings have happened in Knott County that y'all know of? Well, there, you know, it, it's there's one in particular, and I, I'm trying to to dance around this without naming places because some people are kind of weird about that. But my my wife uh, worked as a student at a particular place in Knott County, and uh, she ended up having an experience. Um, well, that's really hard to do that. Not give away <laughs> the place. She was working out. Well, I don't think it's this good. She was working in a radio station, and. Um, She's in there by herself, morning deal. You know, she hears somebody come in, and she says she distinctly hears the sound of a spoon, you know, as it stirs coffee. Mm -hmm. She gets up. She walks to the kitchen, sees who's there. Nobody's there. That door's entryway, I guess, is still locked coming into there. There's nobody there, nobody in there. And that place itself, I know other people who've had experiences there, not just there at that facility, but in that radio station in particular. So to me, that's the first one that sticks out because I got a personal connection to it, uh, you know, and then the area I live in, I live in Pine Top and, you know, there's a place there they call Booger Holler. And if you're from Eastern Kentucky, almost every County has a Booger Holler, a Booger Branch, a Booger Road. And, you know, it's the Eastern Kentucky shortened form of the boogeyman is the Booger. And, you know, that's those stories, you know, were big at a certain time in, in Eastern Kentucky. And at least a little bit of that still carries on, you know, like everybody kind of knows where their local Booger Holler or Booger Branch is. Hmm. I didn't know about the whole Booger thing going oh, yeah. on in Eastern Kentucky. That's cool. I actually sat down to write a book one time and, and kind of cover all of those. And turns out if she's ever published it, there was a lady that had done that. And kind of sit down. Uh, I think there was a gentleman working on it with her. I don't know which one was the author, but I ended up coming, kind of meeting them really with nothing to do with Eastern Kentucky other than my book at the time. And, and we kind of met via that and they mentioned it. And that's been years back. I really wish I had their name. I'm going to look into that and see if they ever come out with that book. If not, I may need to jump on that. Hmm. And uh, there's also some stories that's, you know, not necessarily ghost stories, but there's, uh, you know, and you can look this up on the web. Uh, there's a history of people from Knott County that actually have blue skin. And, uh, you know, they were actually shunned, you know, years ago. And uh, they finally figured out, you know, that a, a doctor had come in from Lexington. And this was years and years and years ago. And they had like an iron deficiency in their blood. And that's what made them turn blue. And they gave them, a, you know, some medicine and that took care of that. Yeah, I remember uh, hearing about that. Everybody was freaked out. And still to this day, I've heard of like blue people, you know, but at least now they know what it is. Back in the 1600s, they probably would have burned them at the stake or something like that. Who knows? Oh, no doubt. Like that is, it was dangerous to be different. It's a little dangerous to be different now. It was real dangerous to be different back then. I mean, who knows what people were thinking back then? Imagine, well, have you seen the pictures of people with blue skin? Uh, like they don't exactly look like blues clues, but 
no. still looks a little bit weird. There's tons of pictures out there for people to check out, and it's it's kind of it's creepy looking, but modern medicine, all right. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, and there's, I mean, like even uh, we we have a couple of episodes in the can. And uh, one of those, we talked about the uh, fairy doors of hazard where uh, like in 2014 or 15, uh, there was a person, male or female, that was very artistic. And um, of a night, a, a buildings, there wouldn't be nothing outside. And the next morning, there would be these fairy doors on the building that are very artistic. And you can find those on the web as well. And they actually have a Facebook page. I don't remember the name of it. Hmm. But. I'll check that out, man. Do you know, have you had, like, have y'all personally had any creepy kind of unusual experiences in Knott County? Go ahead. I'll let you answer that. I I shared this uh, once before. You know, to me personally, no. I grew up obsessed with paranormal, UFOs. I mean, like, obsessed to probably an unhealthy nature. And I think that's a lot goes a long way to why me and and goose can have conversations and kind of jive so well together is i i went away from that and and went so far to the skeptic side that i was boring to be around and like he approaches things logically enough that it brings me back kind of that middle where i should be but when my wife and i first got married um our daughter my stepdaughter her daughter was uh two and a half uh actually i don't think that this we we hadn't quite got married yet we were living in an apartment my grandfather uh had let us stay in until we got married i helped build that apartment when i was younger i mean i know the land i know the history like there's nothing really there you know and i come home from work one day and my wife's sitting on the couch and my daughter is in the bedroom it's a little one bedroom apartment and we're in the process of moving so there's stuff everywhere and you know we'll call her katie uh my daughter katie we'll call her katie because that's actually her name uh, <laughs> she said i'm not that good I mean, why, why even change it i like to embarrass her she's like 23 now so this is not gonna bother her. um she's sitting in the bedroom sitting down and she's talking you know just talking away and i'm my wife's like go ask katie who she's talking to I was like, okay. I mean, you know, I had imaginary friends growing up. Nobody else would talk to me. So I walk into the bedroom. I'm like, Katie, boy, who are you talking to? And she's like, I'm talking to my friend. I'm like, okay, well, who's your friend? She was like, and she told us a name. I couldn't tell you the name to save my life. And you'll understand why I forget the name here. Uh, and she's like, uh, this is my friend, such and such. She has boo-boos. She has boo-boos here and here and kind of pointed towards her wrist and I go straight to my wife and we go to the bathroom. I'm like, oh, uh, you know, what's, what's wrong with your kid? And I was like, what's the, what's the deal here? It's no longer our kid. At this point, your kid. What's wrong? <laughs> and so I go in there. I'm like, Katie, who, who is this person? You know, she gives us a little more information. I go back in the bathroom and I'm like, okay, how attached are we to this kid? You know, is it something <laughs> we have to keep? And if we do, how much therapy is this going to take? And like, we grilled her over it and, you know, I don't know. I don't know where that came from. Like I said, there's no history of anything on that property that should have triggered that. But you're looking at, you know, a kid under the age of three. I don't think she had turned three yet. Where does she come up with this? You know, that's not something like she didn't see it on Scooby-Doo. She didn't see it on any of her entertainment. She didn't watch our TV. She never was a TV kid. I mean, I don't know. How does she come up with that if she didn't actually see something? And that, that kind of weirded me out pretty bad you know and we i my idea was to make the kids sleep outside but we did keep it in the house but still, <laughs> I was like, you know, what, what's going on here dude that is weird like well you there's stories you know of like kids having a sixth sense or whatever especially like really really young kids you know almost in the infant stage like they can sense stuff that maybe you lose as you grow up or something like that. I, I haven't looked into that, but I've always heard stories like that in my entire life. And that would be an interesting Google, I would think. It's, I mean, like I said, it, it weirded me out. And years later, when that movie come out with the little kid that I see dead people kid, yeah. you know, like I was like, 
that's that's my daughter. Like she didn't see as much as he did. Like she didn't see the death of Bruce Willis's career like that kid did. But still, like she <laughs> oh, saw enough yeah. stuff that like freaked me out, you know. And I was like, okay, you know, there's maybe she's got, but never another experience after that. Like she is so much like me as in regards to it seems, you know, I don't know. It's not something we sit down and discuss a lot, but she's not. She's like me. She's afraid of people. She's afraid of bad people. Like, bad people may make her nervous and stuff like that, but she never did seem to be super afraid of anything supernatural, like mask and things like that. I scared the crap out of her with those. Like, she's a little jumpy in that regard, but, you know, she never really had – she didn't ha- definitely didn't have as a kid that love for the paranormal that I had. So, you know, even after that experience, one that she doesn't seem to really remember, apparently, you know, it didn't leave anything lasting. Like, she doesn't have any – you know, she never had any more. If she did, she never told me about them. Yeah, Just, I was going to ask if you uh, asked her about her later on in, in her life. That's Well, it's never directly come up. Like, we all talk about that all the time and joke about it. But it's never like, like I said, she's never just said, oh, yeah, but then this happened, you know. Yeah. What about you, Goose? Have you had any <laughs> creepy experiences? Uh, I have had a few uh, paranormal experiences uh, at the place Justin was describing earlier. Just... uh Uh, going through certain buildings and turning a light off and getting to the end of the hallway and the light come back on now. And I'm talking about you're turning it off from a breaker box. So, and you go back and you check and it's still off, but you got to turn it on and off. And, you know, I I had a few things like that um, at the, like I said, the place Justin was talking about Uh, in 96, I actually did, uh, I actually did see an a, a unidentified flying object across Fork Lake, and uh, it was on Highway 15. Uh, I'd just come off 160, and it was going towards um, Perry County, and there's a little straight stretch where I like there's this telephone exchange that's on the on the right, uh, you know, a little building the houses, telephone equipment, and so forth, and over to the left, over top, uh, about 30 feet above the trees. There was this uh, circular, like typical flying saucer type thing that was in there. It had white lights on the sides all the way around it, and it was shining uh, red and orange lights underneath. And there was a white light in the center. And, uh, you know, somebody was with me that saw that with me, and we actually pulled over, and we watched it for – I don't know, maybe 30 seconds. And when it, when I'm saying it took off and was gone, it was straight up and it was gone in just a matter of like two seconds. It was gone and out of sight. Wow. What, what was it doing anything or it was just sitting there hovering? It, it, it was hovering, but it, but it's light was like uh, coming straight down from it, but it was moving around as well. The light was like the search light. Did you see where yeah. the search light was? Like, the area it would have been, there would have been nothing there. They would have just been, you know, I mean, there there was no structures there because that particular part of the lake, you, you I mean, there's just nothing there. You know, it, uh, you actually have to go to an old strip job and all the way back around. So if you were going to go to that area, you it would probably take a good 20 minutes to get to the area where it was shining at. But, you know, like I said, there's nothing there in that area, structure-wise. That is creepy, man. Now, now I now I see what got you down the uh, rabbit hole of <laughs> UFO. I, now this is where it all started. I, all this makes sense now. Well, you know, and and, and I tell people this, and they, and they they seem kind of shocked. Those that have listened to the show, I always knew since I've learned about Roswell that something wasn't right there. I always knew something wasn't right. That it wasn't what the second thing they said. It wasn't a weather balloon. But as far as these other cases go, I didn't really start believing them until I started doing research and seeing proof that, you know, do- documents and this and that. And then I started thinking, hmm, well, it's not just Roswell. There's, there's other stuff out there as well, you know, because I always try to look at it like I'm – like I'm uh, doing an investigation and I'm putting a puzzle back. I'm putting all the pieces to the puzzle to draw my conclusion. So, so what is it that y'all think was really there at Roswell? I, I know it wasn't a weather balloon, but do y'all think it was 
secret government technology at the time or actual aliens? I think it was an actual uh, alien craft. And I think the first story that they put out was the legit truth because, and I'll tell you why I think that because, you know, I don't think that they'd ever planned for that situation before, you know, the, the government and, uh, and, uh, federal, state, local, they have plans in place for certain things happening. You know, you have uh, states and counties and cities on on the coast of the United States that have plans in place for hurricanes. You know, in our area, you know, we have plans for flooding. We have, and I, and I think that the government does the same way. They have a plan in place for everything, but they didn't have a plan in place for that. And I think that the first report was a legit report. I, you know, I agree with that. To me, Roswell is always one of the ones that I've got a lot of questions about it, but not the way maybe I question some new, you know, some other reports because the, these people come out and if you really look at what happened, you really look at the kind of the time frame it was reported, you know, and, and a lot of interviews by the people around the situation. The report was real. They come out. This is what they thought. They didn't confuse Bossa Wood and Tinfoil for a UFO, and they definitely didn't confuse a weather balloon from it. You know, like everyday people wouldn't have made that mistake, let alone military. So that leads me to one of two things. Do I think it was our technology? No, I don't. Um, I think if it was, they would have been a lot more prepared to cover it up. One, they'd had a lot more idea that it went down. Uh, it wouldn't have took them as long to find it. You know, if it had belonged to them, the situation would have went completely differently. And two, you know, there is that possibility that it's foreign intelligence and they don't want it out. But really, the weather balloon excuse works a lot better than the UFO excuse if it's foreign technology. I really believe wholeheartedly that it either they thought it was a UFO and maybe later found out it was foreign or it really was a UFO that hit. And I, that that's one of those I've never really questioned. To me, you know, so like Goose says, one of the biggest things to me is paper trail. If there's a paper trail in the government, you know, especially one they've worked that hard to hide, then there's something there. It's not by chance. And you have to look, too, at the technology that came after that crash, 5, 10, 15, 20 years later. I mean, it's like it was just so rapidly advanced. You know, you had the transistor, for instance. You had fiber optic cable. Uh, I mean, and the list goes on and on and on. And that, that's, why, that's another reason that I think it was something that wasn't from this planet. See, the, the uh, foreign government technology thing is always one that – it, I either say it was either that or a UFO and the whole foreign technology aspect of it to me, what makes me think of that is like kind of like what Germany and well, really Germany had going on at the time. I was, I wonder how that little of a country was so technologically advanced at the time, because I mean, they were keeping up with us. And I mean, we were, we weren't the superpower nation that we are nowadays, but we were still doing pretty good back then. But Germany, they just, how, how have y'all looked into that? How did they get their hands on everything that they were doing at the time? Uh, do you want to answer that? Well, you know, really it is something I had some, you know, a little bit of knowledge of beforehand, but really that's a big topic that here to chew Bubblegum has covered extensively. And it's one of those things like I learn something new every time I hear you know, there's some of it I, I, I think is a little out there. There's some I think, you know, because there's a lot of stories going around, and Goose probably knows better than anybody about Nazi Germany and their technology. But just, you know, you asking me on the spot, me and you just having a conversation in private, you asked me how, how did we get to our technology? You know, I think there's a good likelihood, like Goose said, it could have been from a downed UFO. So I think that if I believe that about us, and in my opinion, at that point in time, when Nazi Germany was at its peak, they were pretty far ahead of us. I don't believe they got there on their own. I believe maybe same situation, maybe some reverse engineering. You know, they found something, they were able to work with it. And, you know, I'm one of those people I don't think a lot of people consider necessarily a conspiracy theorist guy or an out there guy, but 
I, I believe that to be just as plausible as the fact that, oh, they just got lucky and, and came up with it. You know, I, I'm less inclined to believe that. So I really think, you know, it, it's possible they found something just like we did. Hmm. And, and, you know, um, supposedly, I, you know, there's some people believe that there's, you know, that uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Germany did find this technology through a uh, crash. And you, you can't find much about it because at that time, the media was controlled on what they released and put out, but there was the uh, dark forest crash and uh, that's supposedly where they got their hands on alien technology. And that was uh, like 1938, 30, 37, 38. And uh, you know, there's some people that take it farther that think, you know, that, that Germany went to the moon and all this. I mean, anything's possible, but I don't see a paper trail for that. But you know, you also have to take and just look at their technology, just as Justin said. They were far advanced in this, way, way, way advanced. And then after the war, you know, we got a lot of their scientists, you know, through Operation Paperclip. And combined with what they knew and, you know, uh, again, technology in the United States went ahead leaps and bounds from where it had been. The uh, black, the black forest crash that crash that you mentioned is that the acorn crash? No, no. This oh. this is a different. The only thing that you can find out about it is that there was a crash and that the uh, uh, Germany responded to it and that they uh, recovered some craft. Anything else? That's basically what it says. You can't find anything else, and it's really hard to even find that. Uh, the acorn thing you're talking about. That's that's something else doing with germany so yeah i remember watching like ancient aliens on his yeah. channel one day or something like that and the, they were talking about the acorn ufo crash that happened in germany and i thought that was it no there, there's some people that think that the acorn was like their bail project that you know supposedly didn't some people say didn't work some people say it did work so there's no proof that there was a, a nazi bail project but now, you guys covered a, a story on your show. Mm -hmm. Was it the uh, Pennsylvania crash? Yes. That you know, That's, eerily sounded a lot like a Nazi bail, but yeah. it was, what, 40 years later or yeah, something like yeah, that? Yeah, it was 40 years later. Uh, that, that could have been the uh, acorn one you're thinking about. There, the, the, there's a lot of them out there. I do a lot of research, and sometimes it runs together. So. Yeah, well, you would think that the the aliens or otherworldly beings, whatever they are, uh, they ain't going to keep the disc shape forever. No, they might, they, they, they might figure out something else. I yes. don't know. It depends. It, you know, I think what really interests me about the whole you, the flying saucer deal, you know, is I'm not an engineer, and my knowledge of flights pretty limited. Birds can do it every once in a while humans can do it um you know like it, that that's literally it's a, it's a very minimal understanding when i think aerodynamic and i think flight i don't think a big round saucer i don't think an acorn there's a lot you know those two shapes to me especially the acorn shape seems the least aerodynamic of any of those options yet those are the shapes we're seeing if we were seeing jets you know if, if we were getting reports of ufos and every ufo looked like a jet you know then i'd be like Okay, we're we're projecting our knowledge of flight onto the idea that maybe somebody else is coming here, and there's a little less credence in that because you know uh, Goose has really got me interested in in these black triangles. And that's still really not an aerodynamic shape in regards to what we would think. You know, that's not something we had ever seen that much of uh, in flight and in in the idea of you know aerodynamic design throughout history, but now it's become predominantly one of the biggest sightings of US UFOs over the last couple of decades. And now in turn, it's becoming the shape of one of our biggest top secret po projects as a country. So, you know, it's not like people are just going, yeah, I seen a, a, you know, a double engine Cessna, but I think it was a UFO. You know, they're saying, hey, I seen something that shouldn't fly, but not only does it fly Easily, it flies better than what we produce. You know, maybe mm -hmm. our thoughts on aerodynamics or our thoughts of flight are completely wrong. So that, that gives me a lot of credence to certain stories when I listen to it. I'm like, okay, if you were going to make something up, maybe you would go with something more commonly understood to be 
aerodynamic or flat design. Yeah, whenever the uh, UFO videos were released last year, the ones that the Pentagon talked about and all that, the one that was rotating, that yeah. kind of looked like an acorn. Whenever I seen that video, I was like, I thought back to that History Channel episode that I watched, and I'm like, mm, they might have figured it out because it it didn't look. I, it looked like a, a ball, basically. It was hard to look at anyway with the the video that they released, but kind of had a little bit of a round acorn shape. Yeah, well, you know, and uh, people claim, and, and there's no, I mean, th- this is just conspiracy stuff. There's no documentation to back this up. People claim that uh, the uh, Dark Forest crash, that was actually the classic uh, flying saucer UFO type you know, saucer shape, but there's nothing to, you know, back that up. That's just what they're saying. And they based that on some of the uh, technology that Germany put out just a few years after that, that was similar looking to a uh, classic saucer shape type, you know, UFO. Hitler, well, Hitler and just Nazi Germany in general, they had some weird stuff going on back then so fascinating just to see how out there of a guy he was. I mean, his belief in the occult, trying to find the Holy Grail, UFOs. I mean, the list goes on about the weird stuff that Hitler was into. He was a very evil guy. Don't get me wrong, but kind of an interesting guy right. to talk to, too. Right. And, and you're totally right. But let me, let me paint this picture for you. From what I've been able to find, and it's been a while since I've read this, he didn't start looking for all that stuff until after the supposed dark forest crash. Mm. So if something really crashes and you realize this is real, then wouldn't you naturally think some of this other stuff that you mentioned is real as well or could be real as well? Mm. Or whatever you found lead you to believe that this exists. I always, I always found that interesting. Um, like you said, horrible human being. Uh, but how did he get on the track he got on? I mean, it's possible. I don't know how Dahmer started eating people. You know, I'm, something had to trigger that. I don't know what triggered Hitler, but the, there's the possibility that there was a big change in Hitler and maybe whatever they found wasn't a good thing. You know, maybe that's what sent him over the edge. I mean, this guy was time magazine man of the year at one point. Uh, you know, there were a lot of Americans in the Nazi party at one point before we went to war with them. So, you know, maybe this guy changed overnight and whatever he found might've been really screwed up. You know, I don't. Hmm. That would be interesting to look into if the Black Forest crash really did kind of set them off. Kind of like whenever you seen the UFO over the lake is what really got you going down the rabbit hole. Yeah, I think, I think everybody has something that will get them into something. And I was hoping that last year, when whenever they released those UFO videos, that that would kind of get the general public back talking about it. And to a majority, I think that it, it, it did a lot of people. But it seems like now just everybody's already forgot about it almost. The world is so crazy right now. We got a million things going on. The UFO thing is already like it's getting swept under the rug. I think it's the way it's been approached and the way it's been handled. Like literally we're to a point, you know, we kind of started out of a, at a point in the, very early on where – there was excitement and there was anticipation at the fact, you know, from Roswell on, okay, are there other people or other beings and and where are they from and what do they want to do here? Are they here to destroy us? Are they here to help us? And you had a long, you look at, at science fiction and the way it was written, it was written with this lust and this desire for this other race of beings whether they be good or bad and it fueled one of the biggest industries in the world and and people's imaginations were constantly firing on that and i think it ends up to the day to where you've kind of got it's a split thing it's one all of that dreaming and all that sci-fi may have deadened us to discoveries that are really fascinating you know like those videos or even you know some of the microscopic uh, life we found on other planets, they're no longer enough because you've, be, you've been desensitized by this, you know, this 
fake version of it that if it's not that and doesn't live up to it, then it's it's not good enough. And then also we're to a point to where, all right, when the government was denying there's any even possibility of a UFO, a lot of people were like, okay, well, there's definitely UFOs. And I think we've got to a point where we just trust them so little that now that they're like, yeah, we don't know what these are. Those definitely could be UFOs. Everybody's like, no, oh, no, that's it's not a UFO. They're lying. They're doing this. They're doing that. So it, it, there's a lot of factors that kind of factor into why that didn't hit the way it did hit. But if that had happened, if those videos had existed in the 50s, I mean, oh, yeah. the, the world would have been unmeasurably changed from the day they released on. Even if they turned, Even if they turned out to be our technology or foreign technology, I don't know if you would have ever convinced anybody otherwise. And we're at a point now that I don't think enough people paid attention to them when they were dropped. Hmm. What do you think, Goose? I uh, totally agree with what he said there, you know, and uh, I mean, you have to, you know, you go back and look at Orson Welles and the War of the Worlds. I mean, that's when, you know, they realized, hey, if something really happens, we're going to have to keep this shut, you know, sh- shut down. We're going to have to keep it hush hush because so many people thought that that was real and the panic that they went in, but you have to look, that was, you know, years and years and years ago, maybe, you know, it's time to open the lid up a little bit. You know, maybe people wouldn't panic and freak out today like they did back then, just over, you know, the, the war of the world's broadcast. And, you know, I think that that's one reason that they've always tried to keep stuff hush hush just because people's reaction from that. Yeah. uh, For the people that don't know what that is, that's a very interesting Google. I've actually got that on a, on vinyl at the house, the original. Oh really? Yeah. That, that, that was, that, that was funny learning about whenever I was in high school. I, I loved uh, kind of diving down those rabbit holes back then. But nowadays it's just information overload whenever it comes to, all, all types of whatever conspiracy theory rabbit hole you want to go down. There's tons of them out there. And that's one thing that I think is uh, kind of hurt the movement too, uh, is how it is just information overload nowadays. There's so much to focus on. It's easy to sweep anything under the table. Well, yeah. And you're totally right. But let me ask you a question. Let's say in the war of the world scenario, let's say that was real in today's time. Mm-hmm. Do you think people would react today like they did back then, just when they thought it was real? Well, if they thought it was real, most definitely. I mean, see, I I, I can kind of see both sides. I think that if the government came on TV one day and kind of just sat down and explained to people in a, or, or maybe get somebody like that everybody will listen to, maybe Morgan Freeman or The Rock or somebody like that, Dr. Phil. Dr. Phil. Anybody like that. Somebody that whose voice will set us at ease and we will listen to. But if you get somebody like The Rock to give them a script and tell people that like, hey, there is potential other life out there or, or even that there is life out there and they're coming to visit. I think that if you've done it that way, that people might would actually think that it's cool and be excited about it and be a lot more greeting. But if you were to air War of the Worlds on a radio station, just not tell people about it, especially like NPR or somebody like that done it, people would lose their minds, just like today. And, you know, and the uh, proof that I think is in that is last year, whenever people were killing each other over toilet paper, that, that, that was one thing that kind of disheartened me with uh, the people kind of coming to grasps with that. But then I just had that idea that, well, if you get the right person to explain it to people, maybe we'll have a much easier time going about that process. That's a very good point. That's a very good point. I would like to think that we would react better, but you're exactly right. You know, people going out and causing chaos over toilet paper. So I think – the government believes we're going to have the same reaction as War of the Worlds. And I think a lot of people believe we're going to have either the contact or the Independence Day, you know, reaction. I think it's far more likely we have the Mars attacks 
reaction. And, I, I, you know, sadly, I think if, if things played out, that could be a pretty close representation to what it would be. And, and to our military, just not really knowing how to handle it. Like, if, if we don't have that connection with another worldly people, that, like, they hit us up and be like, hey, we'll be there at 5 o'clock. And our military can just be like, all right, cool. We'll get Dwayne The Rock Johnson on TV and get, get all that ready. If we don't have that connection with them, that buddy-buddy friendship, I think that a lot of people in our military would also be like, hey, boys, it's time to get at it. It's time for our Independence Day. Let's call up Will Smith or something. Because I, I can just see some people in our military just ready to go to war, you know. I would call Bruce Willis. I don't care what Justin says. <laughs> Here's that kid that talks to dead careers and call it. Otherwise, you're not getting in contact with him. I'd call Randy Quaid. That was, that was my favorite person from Independence because we got a lot more Randy Quaids than we do Will Smith. I'm going to tell you right now. Could you, <laughs> could you just imagine? Great that? point. Okay. Let's and 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 let's say you know we're in a war of the worlds type scenario that's real, and craft are hovering over cities and stuff. People in our state, especially our area, they are going to go out there and shoot at this thing. Oh, I mean, yeah. Before any contact's made, if you know they're friendly or, or or not, they're going to go out there and start shooting at this thing. Oh yeah, most definitely. They shoot at drones. One of my buddies had his drone shot out of there by his neighbor because he he probably thought it was the cops or somebody like that. But yeah, and, and that's one thing that I think uh, keeps you know aliens or whoever it is from really making contact with us. I think that we're just the Guantanamo Bay. Well, not Guantanamo Bay, but uh, what's the one place in Mexico? Tijuana. We're the Tijuana of outer space. I seriously think that. We are a very smart race of people, but we're also very stupid, too. I think, unfortunately, that the stupid outweighs the smart. Oh, I and mean, yeah. yeah if, if, well, if they're smart enough to come from another universe or galaxy – and visit us, yeah, they, they, we're not on the same level at all. Well, I mean, terrified. it's what we put out, too. Like, you know, it, we put out so much information, and you're expecting one species of, you know, no matter how intelligent they are, okay, they want to learn more about this planet, you know, get in our podcast, get in our radio shows, our TV shows. That's not going to be hard for them to do, but, you know, you're not going to have as many people listen to this podcast as watch Joe Exotic on Tiger King, you know? And I mean, if they're looking for what's easiest to find and what's most out there, they're not coming to a planet looking for a planet full of Tiger Kings. They don't want that. They, you know, they're, they're going to go elsewhere. They're, they're going to think we're beneath them, you know? And I don't, I, I think, I think what we project as a people Mm -hmm. And then as, as a whole is a beautiful thing, but a lot of times, and it's that way with anything in life, the, the loud, loud minority has the loudest voice and maybe they've just not seen anything out of us that they find all that amazing. And they don't want to talk to us right now. They just want to hide and watch. Yeah. And I, I wouldn't blame them whatsoever. We are still in the infant stage as a, a planet or a race of people, whatever you want to call it. I mean, we're, we're just now getting to the point where we can visit another planet that hasn't been very long ago at all. And the technology, don't get me wrong, it is amazing. But I mean, if somebody's able to visit us from a different galaxy, that is, it's night and day compared to what we are capable of right now. And who knows, like, I mean, like, some people say the government is 300 years advanced uh, yeah advanced ahead of us right now so who knows exactly what we're capable of right now but on a normal civilian scale yeah compared to somebody who can visit us from a different galaxy we don't have a lot going on no but who knows who knows i, I see I, I think the aliens visit us but i just don't think that we have that connection with them and uh, and and maybe maybe we do, or maybe they just come down here and and poke fun a little bit, or just have some fun. Because I can see us doing that, like l legit. If they have the same type of mindset that we do, I can see 
us sending six people to Mars and ABC or Netflix or somebody like that making a, a, a show out of it. Oh, yeah. yeah like, we can that, be that's our natural... You, you know, and that may be a way to, to kind of garner some interest because I know people give Jeff Bezos and these billionaires all this flack for what they're doing. I, I'm not a Bezos fan, maybe in his moral stance on a lot of things and what he does privately in his private life. But I do think that exploration of space is an important thing. It, it, you look at it, you know, people down what he does so bad and Elon's the same way, you know, the, the human in us wants to explore, you know, we, we have this desire to find new places and new things that just it's insatiable. And it was fine when we were, there were new frontiers everywhere. There was the new world and, and it wasn't one collective community the way it is now. We're one global community to some degree. Now everybody knows that somebody's found the United States. Everybody knows that somebody's been to Antarctica. Everybody knows that somebody's been to Australia. Like, so that's kind of gone. And I think that's what that first moon landing done was it gave people that sense of, you know, wanting to, to travel and claim new lands again. And I don't, I don't think that's a bad thing. And I think Bezos and these guys, they may not be necessarily doing it for that reason, but what they do affords us the ability to do that. We went from not being able to go back to the moon to being able to have the possibility to start some type of project on Mars, thanks in large part to Bezos and really more than anything to Musk. And that's the difference in having that, private sector involved we couldn't go back to the moon because we didn't rely on technology to get to the moon we relied on on the fly engineering and mathematics and and it the process of getting there and back was really a complete stroke of luck probably shouldn't have happened um you know i think jack black's mom yes. was pregnant with him during during that and she had to come in and crunch some numbers or at least had to call and crunch some numbers to help get these people back to earth. You know, now we have a computing capacity computer wise that we can do that easily. So if people say we don't have the technology to go back to space or back to the moon, we have the technology. We don't have the funding and the willpower by the government to do so. These private people doing that in privatizing space travel to me helps our opportunities if nothing else, it helps our opportunities of getting more eyes in the sky and catching that planet killer asteroid that's coming our way and maybe having time to send up Bruce Willis to do something about it. You know, I don't, I don't know. It, it's, to me, I think it's a good thing that they do that. And like you said, if that translated 25, 30 years down the road to, you know, bachelor on Mars, okay, then that's fine. If that's the road we got to get to or go down to get to that point, it's it's an even trade to me. Very well said. <laughs> he tells me what to say. He writes it down. He hands it over. To him. And no, after it's done, I say, you know, do good goose, do good. good. He goes, yeah, and he pats me. It's fine. Pat him on the head. <laughs> no, and you know, the way he said he's talking about medicine and side effects. That is true. There are a lot of those, but you know, and there's there's good and good and bad in that. You know, the you know through that technology, people are able to live longer now. And, uh, you know, than what they did, you know, in the late 1890s, early 1900s. Um, and I read an article, this has been a couple of years ago, that, you know, it said people are, people that are alive right now that are uh, 50 or under have a chance to live to be 150 to 200 years old just based on technology. Wow. And, we, you know, you're talking about 3D printed organs. And, I mean, you know, that's, I mean, 3D printing has been around like since the early 90s, but it's just really got popular the last five, four to five years. And, you know, it's getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And, uh, you know, there's, there's some great things from 3D, to, 3D to printing technology. If you can, you know, reproduce, you know, uh, body parts, so to speak, that people could get transplants with, you know, and you can, uh, produce housing for homeless. I mean, you know, and 
technology, if it's used correctly, would be a great benefit and help mankind. And at the same time, you have other people that would just be using it for personal gain. Yeah, it, it seems like people have a love-hate relationship with technology nowadays. And, and I think that that's something that holds us back as a country. Some people think that we go too far, that we play God or, or whatever it is. But I think that if, uh, some, if people would come to grips with the amazing things that we're doing with technology and what doors it can open, then you're going to see some real exponential growth. And I think that the younger generation that's grown up, maybe even four, five generations from now are going to be those types of people that doesn't look at it as going too far or playing God or whatever. They are going to be all for it because even nowadays kids are growing up with an iPhone in their hand or an iPad or just this amazing technology. We're still part of the generation that grew up playing cops and robbers outside and spending our childhoods that way. Nowadays, like, I mean, this right here, we're basically cyborgs with this. This is in my pocket almost at every single minute of every single day. It's at least near me, five feet away from me somewhere. We're becoming cyborgs with technology nowadays. And imagine just four or five generations from now who don't see anything bad in it what doors are going to open up there that's going to be fascinating exactly well i mean i'm big on embracing technology like i don't i don't look at maybe social media as much as being a technology as just our inability to to function together and you know but i I think we have the ability to make things a lot better we just got to get to the point that that becomes the focus and you know, technology is definitely the way to do that. And I think we're to the point now where technology will continue to grow. I think it's just more people need to change. And, you know, that that's that's a process technology can't really help us with. Have y'all seen the uh, new glasses that Ray-Bans and Facebook are working on? Yeah, I, I've, I've saw those. That's crazy. I, I watched a little video on it just a few days ago. And man, I cannot wait to see what comes from that. And that's one thing that I don't trust Mark Zuckerberg. If anybody's an alien on earth, <laughs> it's, it's, it's Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, and Jeff Bezos. Especially I would Elon agree. Musk. I would agree. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah all, all, all three of those. Or, or maybe Mark Zuckerberg used to be like a normal person at one time. Because if you see it, early videos of him, that's what he seems like, a normal person. But whenever he had to testify to Congress last year, the year before, whenever that was. When he sat on the cushion. I think yeah. I think he sent his own personal android to do it. That did not look like a human being. No, 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 it didn't. So maybe they just killed him off and replaced him with a human or something <laughs> like that. Who knows? Forget where I was even going to at this point. Oh, <laughs> the, the, the glasses. Okay. So uh, that's one thing that he mentioned in the video before. And, and for the people that don't know what we're uh, talking about, look up the video. It is absolutely crazy. It's all it is, is Facebook inside video in, in your sunglasses. You can press a little button there on the side and it'll start recording and it just records whatever you look at through the sun, through the sunglasses. And then I guess it uploads it through a cloud, I guess, based. Yeah. and, and uh, that can upload it to Instagram and Facebook. But he said that this was going to open up the door for the possibilities in the future to have technology like like a uh, virtual reality technology based in these sunglasses like you could be we could all be in three totally separate countries and if we all have the sunglasses on we can be playing like uno or chess or something like that with you know virtual holograms but looking through the sunglasses. And then that, I think, is going to open up the door to have technology based in contacts. And the list just goes on and on and on. See, whenever I see some amazing technology like that, I do think that it's great and I can't wait to use it. But I also think about, like, what's this going to open up the door to? What is this going to lead to? And them sunglasses, man, I think is, is going to be a big thing in the future. Oh, yeah, that's our gateway to the matrix yes I See, agree. I, as much as i just said and said i'm a big fan of technology and i am 
I'm one of those guys that are rationally afraid of simulation and I trust Elon to a certain degree. I don't trust him because Elon has said for years that artificial intelligence we should be afraid of. And then he's making every big leap in artificial intelligence there is to be made. So Elon stop. But two, he believes that if the matrix was ever a possibility, if the simulation was ever a possibility, statistically you're more likely to be in it now than not in it. And, and I don't like the whole plan with the matrix deal. Yeah. I, I heard his little talk on that too. And I don't know, like, I would like to think that if we were in a matrix based reality right now, that we would know it. See that, but how, but how would makes, you know? That's what makes you statistically more likely to already be in the matrix. No, you would know it. <laughs> See, that's what I'm thinking. Like, I think that you would know it. You would have to somehow. Like, you would, there, you personally would find a glitch somewhere. I mean, something yeah. would set off. I mean, but, but, he, he, but, but of course they say like, Oh, the glitch could be deja vu. You know, they, they can uh, throw crap at you. And, and then it just makes you think like, dang it. You could be right. I'll joking aside. My fear for the matrix is, you know, for a simulation is kind of the loss of life because I don't think humans can be fully tricked. I think you guys are right in that regard. I think, you put us in that simulation and you make things too good and we eat each other alive. You make things too bad and we eat each other alive. I just don't think we can function in it. So I think a simulation would be the ultimate without sedation. I guess they could sedate us down, you know, but I don't, I don't think it could ever actually work. Who knows though? Cause like, I mean, even with the virtual reality that they have nowadays, how like you can put on the full piece suits and like your entire body, be in the video game what's that going to lead to down the road you know like can people one day almost live their full entire lives inside of a virtual reality i don't know how that would be possible but it's just because i'm too stupid to understand it right now because we haven't got to that advanced technology but that could for real be a possibility i would think it, if that was possible i mean yeah it would be fun to do but to spend your whole life there that would be just sad that would be a life waste but for but for some people you know like that might be a good thing there's some people out there that have crappy lives there's people that's close to that at this point all their news and information comes from facebook all of their visual input and any you know any desires they have are illustrated on instagram any experiences they have are from videos they watch on YouTube. Any conversations they have are from Messenger. I mean, I know people fairly well that, especially since the pandemic, don't have a job, don't have social interaction. Their whole existence is artificial, and they enjoy it fairly well. And I think there'll always be a segment of people that enjoy that. I don't think a computer can recreate what I sense and feel when I take a hike. I don't think a computer can recreate the feeling I get when I see my kids. I don't think they can recreate the level of annoyed I can make my wife. Like those things are just innately human. They can't, they can't be reproduced, but for some people, artificial will be good enough. For some people, it would, you know, and like I said, it would be cool to check out and play every now and then, but I don't think I'd like to spend there. I couldn't do you know, No. Yeah. I, I've and put on and my- to add on what Justin was saying about not making him feel a certain way, I don't think a computer would make me feel in a rush to get to a bathroom after eating Taco Bell. True. Very um, true. Um, and if this is a virtual reality, and whoever created the components and, and, and the uh, little computer stuff, then thank you for Taco Bell. Big yeah. shout to whoever's idea that was. But it's, it's crazy, though, that we're at a point in technology that we have to even question if we're in a virtual reality. Like the point, like, the, if we, like where we have to have this conversation, that's pretty crazy in itself. They're like, I don't think that I'm in a simulation. Maybe, maybe not. It's just crazy we're at this point. Imagine going back to 1910 and telling people like, one day you're going to question whether this life is real or not, whether you're living inside a computer. That's a good I would point. say, what's a computer? Yeah, exactly. And, and I mean, this is just 111 years later. 
Yeah. And then if you said it's like a TV, I would say, what's a TV? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it's, it's, it's a crazy time to be alive, but it's also fascinating and, and fun. I enjoy it. And like, I just know that I, I've let go at this point. I know that one day we're either going to blow ourselves up or World War Four is going to happen and we're all going to nuke each other to death or who knows. I know it's all going to end badly some way if, if, I, if I live to see it. So I'm just here for the ride, man. I, I don't think that – I'm not one of those people that shuns technology or us growing to be a little bit more advanced in the future because I'm just like if, – if they're like, hey, we have a button to create a black hole, I'm like, Go ahead. Let's see what happens. Who knows? I'm I'm optimistic. I mean, I am. To to me, there's no other point in history I'd rather live in. Like, there's points in history I I have nostalgia towards, like the '80s from when I was younger. There's stuff like that. But you know, I look at the world today. Statistically, is better off than it's ever been. And I'm like you. Uh, most of that comes from technology. So I'm a go with the flow guy. I mean, do what you need to do. The, the biggest thing is I think everybody should be able to be free to do what they want to do and just not force other people to do it if they don't want to. Yeah. It's speaking about stuff like that. This video is probably going to have tons of flags from all social media outlets <laughs> that we try to put it on. <laughs> Hopefully not. But boys, thank y'all for y'all's time today. Oh, this is awesome. I have no funny. idea how long we've been talking. I forgot we were in a podcast there at one time. Yeah, yeah. I, I was just having fun. Same here. But I know that both of y'all do a, a ton of stuff, not just Believe It or Not, but you have your own things that you have going on too. So for all the people that want to check out Believe It or Not and all your personal endeavors as well, plug, plug, plug. Uh, you can check out here to chewbubblegum.com. Click on friends or links of the show. The, that will take you to Justin's uh, website and Talk Junkie. And uh, you can also, uh, that will take you to uh, some of the uh, Believe It or Not stuff. Uh, or you can email us, believe it or not, spelled K N L T T at here to chew bubble Um, yeah, check out Talk Junkie, it's pretty well everywhere you can find a podcast. Um, got a new sh new podcast, first episode actually debuted today, and I got to have the spooky family on. Um, the new podcast is Retro Cult. Um, it just it's old stuff, 80s, 90s, movies, music comedy whatever uh check it out it's up on spotify and itunes right now i know for sure and check out youtube page for talk junk i usually put a lot of stuff on there it's on social media on facebook um that's about it justin goose thank y'all for y'all's time today this was fun well thank you for having us on